Let's pray. Almighty God, we are gathered here before you from a dozen, a hundred different places and experiences, carrying with us an assortment of hopes and delights and fears, concerns, things for which we are thankful and things which we dread. We are gathered here, a collection of people, gathered before you, the Almighty One, thankful that we can come into your presence and talk to you, thankful that you are almighty, thankful that you are wise, thankful that you are good, thankful that you hear, can, and will intercede in this world to carry out your good will on our behalf. We can say that much. We can say thankful. I want to ask you, Father, now in this time, even as we look at this passage and, and work through it, would you take what is, what is official, what is declared thankfulness, and would you build into us hearts that are, that are warm and hearts that are tender and hearts that actually are thankful? Hearts that know what it is to rest before you, the compassionate, powerful one who has drawn near, who hears and acts. Spirit of God, we we look to you dependent for this because we cannot make anything happen in our own selves. We cannot make anything happen in other people. We can't make anything be, but you can. So Spirit of God, please work now to take the word and press it into our lives and hearts and make us new with it. We sang earlier that the silent word pleads for sinners. Spirit of God, would you, would you draw near and, and draw to the Father sinners like us? those who don't know you at all and those who do know you but walk away. We are all prone to wander and we pray, Spirit of God, draw us back. Please draw us back. Draw us from all the places that we run off to and draw us back into the presence of this good God. Open our eyes so we can see him. That is our great need, that we would see God. Some here, Lord, don't know what I'm talking about. Open their eyes. For many of us, you have already worked, and we have seen you, and we miss you. So plead. Plead with souls, Lord. Work and draw people to you from wherever we are. Draw us back. Make the word clear. Cause Jesus to shine. Open our eyes to see him. Move our hearts to draw near to him. Humble and lowly before him. And produce in us thankfulness for all the goodness that that he is for us. Father, you're good, and we say thank you. Spirit, we, we pray for your power to run through the room now, to work in hearts now, and to cause Jesus to shine in front of us. Father, Son, Spirit, this is what we ask you to do now. This is what we, we declare we want. Now please bring it and make it so. Cause the word to run here for the glory of Christ and for the good of his church, I pray it. Amen.
turn our attention to Luke chapter 7 this morning where we find Jesus interacting with another outsider of sorts, a widow. Last week at the beginning of chapter 7, Jesus dealt with a Gentile, a military officer in the Roman army. After finishing the Sermon on the Mount, as we saw, Jesus entered into nearby Capernaum. And when he came there, he'd been there often before, and when he came there, he was approached by a delegation sent from this officer, from the centurion, to seek help from him. They came to Jesus, this delegation, and they asked Jesus to come and to heal the, the servant of the centurion who was at the point of death. And the case that they make in front of him is, is one based on personal worthiness. They try to argue with Jesus based on well, who this centurion is and what he's done and why he should get this from him. He should get the, the help of Jesus. That's how all the world works before God, on, on the basis of personal worthiness, what we should get, what we have earned from him. But the centurion's very clear that it's not, that's not his thinking. He knows, and we're supposed to take from this, as he declares it, in fact, that we, we are to realize that there is no such thing as personal worthiness. There's nothing like that in the world. None of us are worthy to stand before God. None of us are worthy to have the help of God. And yet, as we see Jesus commending this centurion, we are unworthy, supposed to approach him in faith. We are supposed to approach Jesus, not based on our own worthiness, but in faith about Jesus, what Jesus has done. That's what's commended for us, that we would come like the centurion came, empty-handed, without a leg to stand on, believing that, as the first beatitude of the Sermon on the Mount says, he gives the kingdom to the poor in spirit. That was last week. A commendation of humble faith in our unworthiness to be before Jesus. We see him heal the deathly ill servant of a centurion, and now we see him do one thing further than that, to raise a son from the dead. He's going to act for another outsider, a widow. Let me read the passage. This is Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 17. Then I'll make just a couple of the details clear before drawing out two observations from the text. This is Luke chapter 7. Soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up, touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. Luke chapter 7. Jesus is traveling with a great crowd and with his disciples also, and for some reason or another he goes to Nain. God has a purpose in this, but people probably were wondering, what's going on with Nain? Because it's just a tiny little town of no significance whatsoever. But God has a reason, and Jesus and crowd approaches. And as they come to the gate of the town, the formal entry place, kind of like the, the official front door. This place was so small, there wouldn't have been a wall built around the town. But, but every town had an official front door, a gate. He's approaching the gate to come into the town, and... What do you know? Behold, it just so happens that out of the gate comes a funeral procession on the way to the cemetery. Jesus looks over the procession, takes it all in and understands it, sees what's going on. He approaches and speaks to the widow, and then he approaches the body. And we are carefully told he touched the platform on which the body under a shroud had been laid. Didn't touch the body. 
But Luke tells us that not because it would keep Jesus ceremonially, ceremonially unclean. He tells us something very particular there. He touched only the thing he was on. Now, that wasn't necessary because he could have just said, of course, stop, hold on, the bearers would have stopped. There's a big crowd that everybody knows who Jesus is at this point. But he touched it. And that did make him unclean according to the law of the Old Testament. But he understood that to come in contact with an unclean thing like a dead body or in contact with a thing in contact with an unclean body, if you touch a body or you touch a grave that has a body or if you're in the tent that has the body, if you touch the thing that the body is sitting on, you become unclean. And Jesus did that and became ceremonially unclean, but he didn't touch the body itself, which becomes important. Because by a simple word only, he raises this boy, this young man, from the dead. He speaks to him, and he comes back to life. And notice the, the language puts a little bit of emphasis here, which is hard for us to grasp because we've read this stuff so much. Now, we, we almost kind of yawn. He raised somebody from the dead. I mean, next chapter he's going to do the same thing. Later, he's going to raise Lazarus. I mean, he just raised people from the dead. <laughs> the language of the chapter draws us up short by saying, the dead man sat up and spoke. Now, of course, that means he came to life again, but it's, he didn't come to life lying under the shroud and say, hey, what's going on? And move the shroud away. He just, up. And he speaks. Not a movie. The dead man sat up and spoke. At the word of Jesus. And Jesus gave him to his mother, and fear seized them all. You bet. But in this situation, we don't have the fear that, that grips them. The fear that grips them is not the fear that we've seen before of of total, unexpected, out of the blue, don't know what to do with this sort of who are you shrinking back. By this point, Jesus is known and the, the litany of miracles that he has performed in this region, people know. And he arrived with a crowd. People saw him come. And he talked with the widow. So there was some lead up to this. It's not completely terrifying fear. There's more of a, of a reverence in this because they did two things. Fear seized them and they glorified God. There is something that, a fear that settles on the crowd here that certainly is I'm in touch with something else, something other, but it leads them into glory, to glorifying God. A prophet has come, a great prophet. God has visited us and word spreads everywhere about this. That's the passage, Jesus raising the widow's son at Nain. What are we to make from it? Well, I'm going to draw two observations. One about Jesus in particular, and one about a little bit larger picture. What this is intended to point us to in the big picture. But first, Jesus directly. In Jesus. And as I say this, let, we, we constantly deal with this problem. When we look at the Gospels, we've read them too much. So I'm not going to make any statement here that it would never have occurred to you before, but what I plead with you to do is, is to sit under it and listen to it and think about it again. There is something here in this first point in particular that should, that should grab us in the middle of widow-like despair and draw us onto hope. Because, here's the point, in Jesus, despairing people can find the greatest of all compassionate power. In, in Jesus, despairing people and if you don't think that's you, hold on, we'll come back around to that. It's going to be you. Despairing people in Jesus can find the greatest of all compassionate power. Here's a woman, a widow, and in a way a whole town that is mourning in deep despair. 
The townspeople less so, of course, but, but it makes a point, the text makes a point that there are a large number, a considerable number of folks were with her because they also are grieved for her. They realize, struck once with, with the death of her husband and struck again with the death of her only son, and, and they're grieved by this. They themselves are mourning, but certainly she more so. She's already wept over the death of her husband. She's a widow, which makes her vulnerable in any society, but particularly back then. She's vulnerable to exploitation. She's maybe even unable to provide the basic needs of life. You know, in, in a society based on muscle, widows are at a disadvantage. But, thankfully, she has an able-bodied son. The only male heir, and so she ties him, he ties her to inheritance in the land, ties her to family name, ties her to food, protection, so she's okay until he dies. And not only is, is the, the heartbreak of the loss of another loved one, the bearing of a child, but, but there, is, there is a real, hard for us to, to get perhaps, but a real fear of am I going to make it in this life as a widow all alone. She's heartbroken and she's afraid and she weeps in despair. In verse 13, the Lord saw her and had compassion on her. The word compassion. Jesus is emotionally moved. This is Jesus. This is Jesus. He's not working out the calculations and, and seeing intellectually on paper a problem. He is in the heart, gripped, moved. This is your, this is the Jesus of the Bible. He is a caring Jesus, a compassionate, a, a gripped and, and internally mm, weeping on behalf of those who weep, Jesus. This grips him. He cares. Such that we, we realize this, that if, if you were there, you would, you would see this. This one, this Jesus, is, is really honestly for her. We've seen on every, in every chapter of this gospel so far, we've seen Jesus consistently receiving people, coming to him. Last section it was a centurion, coming to him with problems. And he, he graciously, kindly addresses every one of those problems. But this is different in that Jesus initiates. He sees this going on. They're just walking by on the way to the cemetery. He sees this he interjects himself into the situation and in compassion says to her, don't weep. Which is not a command. Stop your, stop your crying. It's a don't weep. Don't cry. Words of encouragement that he's going to back up with power. He spoke to her tenderly and then verse 14 what Luke's trying to show us here is another instance of what the centurion recognized, you have great authority. Luke's whole point in describing what he touched is to say he didn't touch the body. He just spoke to the body. Which is like the centurion said, you say, go, come, people under authority, things under authority, obey your word. That's a statement about authority which comes out... In, even more so, it, it, the importance of that statement is highlighted even more when you see the connections to the Old Testament prophets, Elijah and Elisha. The crowd calls him a great prophet. Why do they say that? Because in their minds, they see direct connection with Elijah and Elisha, two back-to-back -back prophets in the Old Testament. The miracles of God, if you, if you were to read the whole Old Testament and kind of note where all the miracles happen, they are not evenly distributed throughout all the Old Testament. They kind of appear in clusters. 
They're sprinkled here and there, but they appear in clusters around times where God's working in great miracle workers and doing some great movement of deliverance. And one of those great clusters is the Elijah-Elisha cluster. Each of them performed all kinds of miracles, and each of them, in separate instances, raised a dead son on behalf of a particular woman. Both of them did. Elijah, you could read about this in 1 Kings 17, he met a widow at the city gate of a town called Zarephath. And he saw her son, and it's described as if they're just the two of them. It doesn't say it's an only son, but described that way. And we, we read the account, and we see him get sick and die and see Elijah raise him back to life. And Elisha, in 2 Kings chapter 4, we read the account of how he raised to life again the son of the Shunammite woman. Parallel is stronger between Jesus and Elijah, including even very similar wording where it says, actually identical wording, Jesus, it says, gave him to his mother. Same phrasing in the account of Elijah. Gave him to his mother. Parallel is stronger there, but both of them undeniably similar. Except in how the actual raising happened. Maybe you know the stories. Elijah and Elisha both prayed to the Lord fervently, we are told. And they both had to have extensive physical contact with the dead body. Elijah went and laid body to body, laid on the boy three times. Cried out to God three times before he was raised. And Elisha, same thing. In fact, Elisha tried to heal him from a distance, tried to send his servant along with the staff, said, take my staff, touch him, I'll pray. Didn't work. Elisha had to come and again lie on the body. And it's very graphic. It says mouth to mouth and eye to eye and hand to hand, twice crying out to the Lord. And only then did the boy come back to life. So we have an unmistakably similar incident. Everybody's raising dead boys to life and giving them back to their mothers. They're unmistakably similar, except in the great differences. Jesus does not pray to the Lord, but in fact, for the first time in the whole Gospel of Luke, Luke calls him the Lord. Other people have called Jesus Lord, meaning different things, but Luke, for the first time here, calls him the Lord. He doesn't pray to the Lord, he is the Lord. And he doesn't touch him at all, he just says, sit up. And the dead body does. What Luke's trying to show us, what we, what we should see here, is that there is something, there is compassionate power here that is similar but greater than anything anybody has seen before. And this is the Jesus of the Scripture, your Jesus, who has a heart that is compassionate for outsiders, for weak people, for widows, for servants, for Gentiles. He has compassion, he's moved, and then has incredible power to back that up and create difference. He has words that are tender, and he has power that backs it up for her and for us. Because there's nothing here in her story that's fundamentally different than what we face. Talking about despairing people here. That's all of us. That's all of us. Some, some of us at some times, maybe even just sit here, sit here right now, this story kind of touches you in a certain way because you know the particular pain of the death of a, of a loved one, a spouse, or the death of a child. So this resonates in a certain way with you. 
But then more of us can identify with the particular fears that she faces in the death of those loved ones, being alone and being physically and financially, even very much food, materially vulnerable. You can identify with that maybe. We all seek to build lives and we build careers and we build families and we build homes and we secure them as best we can and we lock the doors and we take out insurance policies and we exercise and we eat well. But you know this, don't you? That in the moment of your your greatest delight, you are a breath away from deep despair. People die on their honeymoons. Not everybody, of course, but not nobody. Little children perish. Not all, but some. You're finally getting your career in order and you're finally gathering your marriage together and you finally had a bumper crop and you build great big barns to hold it all in. You fool, this very night your life is demanded of you. Every, there isn't anything in life that secures us. We can sit, we, we do sit, we so often sit. Ah, I finally got it all pulled together. But everything is vulnerable to the whims of the world, to the sin of other people, to the weather patterns. You can't control anything. There isn't any securing force. There isn't anything that covers us, nothing that protects us. We all are incredibly vulnerable and will be dropped into despair, sometimes watching a loved one go through something and sometimes it being ourselves that face it. There is nothing in this world that secures us, that protects us, except the power of Jesus. Nobody believes that. I just said that to you, and yeah. We we hang. We we hang just I think I'm plenty strong, that I'm I'm plenty healthy, I'm I'm young, I'm intelligent. You think the same thing about yourself, no matter how old you are. More than we realize, that's what we're standing on. None of it is real. Any one of us could be dead by nightfall. Anything that you trust and anything that you hope in could be gone quicker than you realize. Men and women, we we live tenuous lives. We, We exist barely. The only thing that upholds us in any moment, in any moment, the only thing that gives you breath in the next second is, in fact, only the power of God. Is it enough for you to know that the power of God for you in Jesus is shaped by the great compassion of Jesus? Put it another way. The only thing that sustains you is the power of God and thank God that that power of God for you, if you're a Christian, think about this, for you is shaped by, is undergirded by the incredible compassion of God. Is it enough for you that the compassionate power of Jesus is? Because it is. Because it is. Christian, Christian, you have this Jesus for you in power and in compassion. Now, does that mean he's going to raise my my deceased loved one? Not necessarily. Obviously. You know, there were, there were other towns in Israel that he could have gone to that day where there were other funerals going on. He didn't go there. He raised this one 
and only this one on this day. So there is no promise that he raises everyone on every day, but there is a promise that he can raise anyone on any day. That power, that compassion is for you, Christian. Is that enough for you? Is it enough for you? You can answer that question by saying, in then the face of despair and in then the realization of my tenuous life, do I rest or am I still grappling after additional securities? <coughs> additional securities. This is great news. This is remarkable truth for which you, Christian, can be thankful that the Jesus of this passage, the Jesus of incredible, compassionate power initiating with his people, is for you. That is good news. And it should lead you beyond just declaring, I am thankful for him. And it should lead you to be thankful as you realize that this is him and he is yours. In Jesus, despairing people can find the greatest of all compassionate power. He calls you to himself. When people saw the power of Elijah and Elisha in the Old Testament, it drew people to them to say, help. When you see Jesus like this, does it draw you to him? You can find great power for you in Jesus. And so at his feet, you should lay all of your concerns. You can lay all of your concerns. The intractable ones that have no solution. Lay them at his feet and trust compassionate power for you. This is the first piece, a showing of what Jesus is and who Jesus is for us. But the second observation kind of moves us a little bit beyond just what we see about him to what's going on here in this story, some of what's going on in the story. Here's the second observation. God visits us in Jesus to bring the dead to true life so as to bring glory to himself. I'll say that again. God visits us in Jesus to bring the dead to true life so as to bring glory to himself. I say God visits. I take that word from verse 16 where the, the crowd says, God has visited his people. They recognize something about Jesus and his great compassion and power. They connect him to the prophet idea. And they know that where God acts in a great prophet, God is visiting his people. That is, God is, is coming to his people to do something, usually something good. This idea is spread throughout the Bible. Throughout the Old Testament, you could read the words used often. God visits sometimes to, to overcome famine, to, to relieve disease, to deal with corrupt government, to deliver from foreign enemies. He visits them often to do good. We saw it in chapter 1 of Luke. Zechariah prays in thanksgiving, God has visited to redeem his people. God visits the people recognize Jesus. God is visiting us in Jesus. All these miracles that he's performing and the miracle that he just performed of raising this widow's only son and, and bringing back to life her loved one and, and placing her back in a position of security. God has visited us in Jesus. Yes. But, and it may seem, it's deliberate, it may seem like I'm pushing one way in the first point, and now I'm going to push the other way against that first point. Because, ironically, the first point could all be idolatry.
if we focus only on God visiting, God drawing near to miraculously address all of the circumstantial issues and fears and needs in my life, if that is our focus and that's how we view God and that's what we think of God doing for us in Jesus, it might be just a furthering of the idols in our own heart that we worship every day. We might be completely misunderstanding what God's doing. Here's what I mean. We are, every one of us, every man and woman of every tongue, tribe, and nation of all time, we all are in ourselves inclined to overlook God, to miss God, to discount the relevance and importance of God. To turn to him, though, then only in moment of need, once every other hope has been tried and has failed, we turn to God then and seek him then in our moment of need, but viewing only God as the one who meets our momentary need. I need you because I need this. If you can give me this, okay. So when we seek him and perform all of our religious works, we are in fact serving ourselves. This is the way of the world, and it is common even to us in the church. It is possible then that we can look at the first point and we can look at the compassionate power of Jesus for us and totally miss the the great and Godward work of God in sending Jesus for us, and we can turn him into essentially sugar daddy, checkbook. We can turn him into the one who just gives us our stuff for us. This story is intended to draw us out of ourselves and to, look, and to cause us to look up and to see something far grander and far larger than just me and my needs here in this world. We are men and women sit under this and realize I'm, I'm going somewhere with it, but sit under this because You will only get where I'm going if you first sit under this and realize the gravity of our situation. We are born incredibly self-focused and have no room for a, a sovereign, ascendant, supreme God. We love the Jesus of compassion and power because he's the kind of Jesus who gives us what we really want. He protects the lives of our loved ones and secures our our material goods. Thank you. Bless the Lord. That's coming out there and careful. It's coming right in here. So I know it's coming in you because it's coming right in here. And it would be right for the sovereign God to judge such common ways of mankind. Right and good for him to bring an end to this. And so he has. He said, I will not stand with them forever. I put an end to their years. We all stand under the judgment moving towards physical death that is an undeniable proof that we are in the wrong even as we live. Do you get that about yourself? Do you get that about yourself? 
This is you. Bent so strongly, so deeply inward, pride lives full bore in every single one of us. We live moving towards the grave, which is like a cloud that hangs over us, foretelling a future storm. All that comes to every single one of us is death, and after that, the death. And God would be right, God would be good to visit upon us in any and in every day judgment. Because this is wrong. That we human beings, we creatures made in his image, set him aside and only summon him up to meet our desires and attempt to turn him and twist him to be servant to me. All that would be left if he were to visit upon us judgment would be our grudging admittance that his judgment is right and true and that I am a rebel. Some deny this. But the Bible is clear we are dead in our sins. Well, that's the Bible. No man ever wrote a religious book that says he's hopeless and he can't do anything about it. No man ever wrote a religious book that says he's hopeless and can't do anything about it. That's the word, the truth of God to us. We are dead in our sins. Behold a wonder. Behold the astounding, great, vast, wide, long, high, deep mercy of God. We lie dead on a platform under a shroud being carried to the grave and to judgment. That's who you are. And God visits not in condemnation, but in powerful, compassionate mercy. With this Jesus, and only with this Jesus, he can't do it any other way, only in this way. That's who we are, and God visits us with a Jesus that reaches out and touches, deliberately, deliberately touches to take upon himself. Can it be? To take upon himself off of you death and condemnation and uncleanness and take it onto himself, rendering himself that in our place and giving from himself the only alive one clean, pure life. All the details are not here in chapter 7 of Luke. But the contours of this great mercy are traced out enough that we can see, perhaps you can see or hear. Romans chapter 5, verse 6, while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Maybe you can see Ephesians 2 here. God being rich in mercy. Rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us while we were dead in our trespasses and sins. He made us alive with Christ. By grace you've been saved. He died as a substitute for the weak, for the sinners, for the dead, for you. Why? Not so that we could carry on as we were. We're not brought to life to keep living that old life of death. We're brought to life 
that fear and praise would break forth from us. It's what happens to the crowd when they see this, this bringing of the dead to life. Fear sees them and glorifying of God breaks forth. That's surely the right response, the one that God wants from us. To put it in different words, what he wants from us is a people that are brought to life and moved. A people that are changed as fear grips us and glory grips us. The whole problem that we have at the beginning is that, that we live like this, looking down, centered on our own lives, and God is, is distant somewhere, summoned to help me, but then set back on the shelf. And what God aims to produce in us is the fear of the Lord, that this God would come in front of us and would rise up and would grab us, that we would be not just looking, glancing occasionally, but fixated on him, living towards him, living Godward lives. So it's just this God fills everything that we see, fills everything that we do, colors every movement that we make. It is hard to imagine these folks ever forgetting this moment when the dead man sat up on the plank Something grips them there and sets them in a different direction. God aims in his glorious, merciful bringing of us to life to grip us and move us in a different direction, moves in a Godward direction to produce in us a holy fear, a reverence of him, not a cringing. The fear of the Lord, I suppose you should be clear about that. The fear of the Lord is not a cringing. It is not a, it's not a sitting under his hammer. It is a reverence, an awestruck grabbed vision oriented towards God life. The fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of all wise living. He grabs us and raises us from the dead. That's why I said you must grasp what I was saying earlier. I'm talking about you when I talk about dead. And I'm talking about you when I talk about alive. Do you get that? Dead, alive, glory. And if you uh, yawn, then this is not going to happen for you. Dead, alive, all by the zeal of the Lord that has accomplished it. He aims to draw out from us fear, that is, holy fear, an awed reverence, a right comprehending of who he is, very closely tied to the end they glorified his name because glory, the word for glory is similar to the word for, for weight, for the weight for heaviness. Fearing the Lord, a, a weight rests on you. Like, think of one of those lead aprons that they drape on you when they're about to take your picture of your dental fillings. You feel this thing that sits on your whole body. A lead apron, a weight that rests on you. It doesn't weigh you down so that you're pinned and can't move, but you can't not notice it. God aims to rest on us a fear of him, an awe of him. The red is to rest on us his glory. That we would comprehend something about him, something marvelous about him, and what would come out of us consciously and unconsciously. We can't not notice it. It steers, it, it directs everything that we do, everything that we are. What would come out of us is a Godward praising and a Godward honoring of him in everything in our lives. We are saved to be different, not the same. He aims to draw out from us fear and glory. A praising and an honoring of him. 
is that we are no longer living dead in the world, but we are alive. Alive to God. Alive to His goodness. Alive to His reality. Alive to His promises. Alive to His truth. And alive to His people, to His kingdom. Do you know such a life? Can you say of yourself, I was dead and I have been made alive? I was dead and I have been made alive so as to live. I was dead and I have been made alive so as to live in holy fear and in the glorifying of God. To live no longer for myself, but for him who loved me and gave himself for me. Can you say that? Is that true of you? And more than just, can I say it? Do you say it? And I'm not talking about the, the rote reiteration of that phrase. I'm talking about... Does it run through your mind? Does it fill you? I was dead and I'm alive by the grace of God. Does that fill you? Or is that on the shelf somewhere, left off to the side as you pursue life? Don't, oh, don't do that. You're, you're pulling out the power cord. If you're, if you're trying to live like that, you're pulling out the power cord. That, that vision, I was dead, and by the grace of God, I am alive. That truth, that vision, that reality is what God means to run through you, to build in you fear and glory and Godwardness and joy and delight. You were dead. By the compassionate power of Jesus, God visited you and made you alive. Life for you is different, different forever. To yourself then, say that. To yourself then, preach that. To yourself, remember this. This is Jesus for you. God sent to save you and bring you to life. It is a glory. It is a goodness and it is a mercy. May God make you truly thankful. May God press this into you that you would walk in joy in it. You would never forget it. You would remember, I sat up dead and began to live by the grace of God. Let me pray. Father, I don't know where we all come from here. You do. So take the pieces of what was spoken this morning that are most relevant to each person and press them home, please. That which was less relevant, that which was confusing, set it aside, but that which is relevant, that which would produce fruit, Press it home and produce difference. Produce different people. Produce a different church. Or would you save some? Would you speak to those of us, some of us who are saved and frankly view you as the genie in the bottle? 
speak to us and reorient our thinking. Speak to us, some of us who, who view you as disinterested and, and gone, who haven't noticed any of your visitation recently and wonder where you are. Speak to us and assure and remind Lord, would you build your church? Build up Christians who walk in the fear of the Lord, who walk glorifying you. Build up Christians, Lord, who are keenly aware of being brought to life from death and are shocked by that every day. Build up a church that walks in this great joy and walks in freedom and walks in a way that is compelling to the world all around that does not know any sure security. Build a people, Lord, please. Honor your name. Be the center of our thinking and the center of our hoping. Be our joy and our love. Thank you, Father. We put our trust in you. We say thank you. Amen.